Overtime! Now that it's warming back up again out here in the garage at Overtime Arcade, I wanted to keep working on the Qbert cabinets that I've been restoring. Now, I don't have a ton of time to spend on these tonight because right now it's Wednesday when I'm filming this, and later this evening we're gonna be doing our monthly members only live stream, which is just one of the awesome perks that we offer to Overtime Arcade channel members who are so kind and so generous in their support of the channel. If you're interested in learning more about what it means to become an Overtime Arcade channel member, Click on that join button down below, it'll tell you all about it. Uh, and in particular, I wanna thank our newest channel members, Tony Arrowwood, Jay Cosper, and Ty Laurie. Uh, a couple of names that might be familiar to those of you that have been in this hobby for a while. So there's a couple of things that I want to accomplish in this episode, but before we dive into anything really, really difficult, <laughs> let's look at some laminate samples. So I mentioned in a previous episode that I had been working for about a month or so, uh, trying to strip the black paint off of these cabinets. So I've got two Kubert cabinets, both of which have been converted to other games, both of which had the sides painted over black. The original yellow sides were painted black. And I wanna get that back to yellow because I'm restoring these back to Kubert uh, cabinets. And uh, these sides, the paint came off okay. The other sides I showed, I think it was in a, a Frogger video, really giving me a, a lot of grief. So I kind of decided, you know, especially since the sides that I've, I've stripped the paint off of, they're not perfect, right? So. The, the one on the left over here has this X scratched into it and the paint's all splotchy and there's damage up here. Uh, and over on this one, you know, most of it looks better. This is quite a bit better, but then down at the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see it, down at the bottom here, uh, there's a couple of inches of water damage, you know, pretty bad water damage uh, down there. So I was gonna have to, you know, really strip these down to bare wood uh, anyway. And, you know, I thought about maybe painting them and trying to match the paint and getting everything sort of super smooth and perfect and whatever with Bondo and whatnot. But uh, that seemed like a lot of work, especially since I have two full cabinets that I'm restoring here. So I've decided to go the laminate route. So basically with laminate, uh, you get a material uh, that's you know kind of rigid, right? And you <laughs> essentially glue it to the cabinet and it makes it perfectly smooth, perf perfectly flat, perfectly uniform. You don't have to worry about matching the color. You don't have to worry about you know, the texture of the color and did you sand it smooth enough and are you getting orange peel you know, texture from the, from the paint. Um, you know, vinyl really shows through a lot of imperfections. So you know, that, that might be from the, the material underneath. So laminate is kind of the way I've decided to go. Uh, I've never done this before. I've seen it done a bunch of times. I've been getting a lot of tips from uh, Jeff Kinder, who is also an Overtime Arcade channel member, he's got an awesome channel called What Would Jeff Kinder Do? He's done laminate a bunch of times. You know, basically you strip it down to bare wood, get it relatively you know, um, you know, smooth and flat sanding, you kind of fix corners, whatever you need to do with Bondo, but you don't have to go super crazy. And then you glue the laminate on and then use a router. Actually, I think you go counterclockwise. I gotta, I gotta review all those tips. Uh, and you cut, use a router to sort of trim it back in and, and you're done, right? Quick and easy, get it done in a couple of hours as, as opposed to you know, how many days is it gonna spend you to paint it or, what, or, or whatever. So the biggest challenge that I'm having though is finding laminate that's a good color match. And uh, I've got some samples here we'll take a look at in a second. The problem though is it, it, you can kind of see it in the camera. It's a lot more noticeable in, per, in person. These yellows are not the same. So uh, the one on the left has quite a bit of blotchy spots, you know, splotchy, blotchy, whatever, the white coming through, whatnot. You know, you can see where the artwork was, it's sort of, I don't know. Uh, over here, it's a little bit more uniform. You can still kind of see where the artwork kind of left a shadow, I don't know. But these yellows don't match, right? So this is like a, I would say a little bit richer, almost orange uh, yellow. This is almost more of a greener yellow. You know, part of me is thinking, right, was this a factory Qbert? Was this a Qbert Cubes? Did Qbert Cubes have a slightly, did, well one, did they even make any factory dedicated Qbert Cubes? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, I should have maybe checked before running my mouth on this video. And if so, was the yellow slightly different, right? This is a, I think a later serial number, I think this is like 10,000 something. And this is, um, 
much lower, maybe in the 6,000s. I don't know. But these two yellows, again, I don't know how clearly it's coming through on camera. These two yellows are not perfect matches. This one is more orange. This one is more green, right? So I don't know. So I got a bunch of laminate samples here, including for uh, <laughs> the Frogger. So the Frogger is another story, right? If you saw me, I was stripping the black paint off of the, the Frogger and is even showing up on camera. You know, kind of damage the sides a little bit. You know, I was hoping to strip off the black paint and recover the original wood grain vinyl, but I really, really ruined the vinyl on the sides. Uh, anyway, I can't find a great match uh, for the Frogger. I was thinking about maybe doing vinyl on the Frogger, which is a lot of work to prep. Um, you know, and in my mind, I always thought that vinyl was cheaper than laminate, but what I've been looking at price-wise, it's essentially the same, right? Uh, and laminate is less work and you typically get a better result in the end. So I'm going to go the laminate route. I haven't found an exact match yet for the Frogger. Um, I've got some samples here. These are all Pionite samples. The company's named Pionite or maybe the, the, the product brand is Pionite. See, it says it right here, Pionite. And I think the company is uh, Panolam. These are all from the same company. They kind of sent me these samples in two different shipments. I think they came from different warehouses. I don't know. I haven't found a great match uh, for the, uh, the wood grain vinyl on the Frogger. I know I was looking at the, the Claw forums and I think it was uh, Fetish Boy. Um, he had uh, done laminate on a Frogger and he used this one, which is, I don't know if it'll show up, Pionite. Wisconsin Oak. I think this is the one he recommended. And I mean, this is probably the closest match of the, the samples that I got. These are all too light. This one is the right, maybe darkness, but this is more red. And the, the, um, the, the Frogger has almost got like a, a green tinge to it. Um, so this is like too red. I don't know. I'll have to check it against the, the carnival uh, that I've got in the basement. But anyway, we're not talking about Frogger today. We are talking about uh, Qbert, right? Our two Qbert cabinets here. So these are the uh, the laminate samples that I got from Pionite. Um, and one of these here is just automatically, you know, right off the bat, not gonna go. Uh, this is, uh, what color is this? This is Sunray, I think it says right there. Nevermar, I don't know what that means. Uh, is that a different brand? I don't know. But yeah, this is definitely way, way, way too orange. So this one is definitely out. These other two, are allegedly the same color. And I'm not sure why they sent me two. And you can even see the sort of, um, there are, there's a little bit of variation between them if it shows up on camera, definitely in the kind of uh, reflection uh, of them. Um, oh, maybe it's because of this. Okay, so these both say primary yellow, if that'll focus. Uh, the one on the left says satin, and this one says textured suede. So I'm gonna have to, I just noticed that. So I'm gonna have to keep that in mind. Uh, I think we probably want the satin. Uh, is a closer uh, finish. So anyway, holding these up here, and again, yeah, I'm not sure how the light is gonna catch it, what that's gonna look like on camera. I feel like this is a pretty close enough match, right? Like over here, um, and in fact, let me put this one down, just because I think the satin is closer than I want. The textured suede is almost like a matte. I think originally these were like a, a semi-gloss even. Um, yeah, like a semi-gloss. So satin won't be quite as uh, shiny, but that's not too bad. So yeah, I think we're pretty good match over here. There's some angles where it looks better, some angles it looks worse. I feel like this is pretty good and it's not so bad over here. Again, this is a little bit maybe greener or more yellow and this, uh, this cabinet on the right is maybe a little bit more orange, but I feel like this is pretty good. I don't know. I might go and grab, um, see if I can get some, some samples for some, from some other companies. I, kinda, I, I like the color or I like the, um, uh, the price point that this Pionite is at, it's, it's not bad. And uh, there's a, a company that Jeff uses, Jeff Kinder uses called, I think it's Top Cabinet Hardware. And uh, Jeff's got a hookup there. He buys all his laminate from there. I think they're in Florida maybe. And uh, I've heard that they will, and don't quote me on this, uh, that they will ship up to six uh, four by eight sheets for the same price. And I need to get six sheets ultimately, right? So one sheet per side of each Qbert uh, cabinet times two. So I'm gonna get four sheets of yellow laminate. And I think I can get away with just two sheets of the wood grain. Uh, Jeff took some measurements for me and we think that we can do uh, both sides and the front kick plate of the Frogger with just two sheets of laminate, basically using you know one sheet and like cut it really uh, close. And that'll be enough, because uh, these are four by eight sheets and these cabinets are only like six feet tall, maybe even a little bit less. 
And so I can do, uh, uh, use one sheet to do a side on the front kick plate and then a second sheet to do the other side. And the Q-Birds, I don't have to worry about that because the front of the q is black. But I think the route, that's the route that I'm gonna go. So uh, maybe I'll grab a couple more samples, but if not, um, I think like this is a pretty, pretty good match. You can even see it like there, right? When I hold it like this. Uh, that's a pretty good match, you know. The light's gonna catch it differently, but yeah, Panolam Pionite uh, Prism Yellow is uh, kind of what I think we're going for. So hopefully that'll work. If not, <laughs> I'll figure something else out. All right, with that out of the way first, uh, I wanted to turn my attention to the joystick or joysticks as it were. So I'm doing two cabinets. I'm going to ultimately need uh, two joysticks. And uh, I've got one right here that is a you know pretty decent shape uh, original Qbert joystick. Uh, these were manufactured by STC Rotterdam, if you can see that uh, really close, if that'll focus, STC Rotterdam. I think STC stood for Suzo Trading Company, so this was before it became Suzo and then Suzo Hap. So often called the Rotterdam uh, joystick. This is sort of an, an unusual design. It's a short throw joystick, which means the, the shaft uh, doesn't really move all that much. It's got a plastic ball top and a plastic sort of sheath over the uh, the shaft here. Um, it's a micro switch uh, joystick, which is kind of unusual for this time. You know, um, it was that was more of like a Japanese thing to use micro switches. Like um, I know Nintendo uh, uh, did that. But uh, yeah, we've got these red original uh, micro switches on this original Qbert joystick, but it's kind of all floppy and sloppy, right? So it twists really easily and, and just it's, it doesn't feel all that great. The actuator is cracked. So I want to rebuild uh, this joystick. I have a couple of rebuild kits here that I got from uh, Arcade Shop. We've got a new grommet and this uh, rubber O-ring and we've got a new uh, E-clip in there. And I'll sort of show you, this looks a little bit weird, I know. I'll show you how that all makes sense on what's going on in the inside here. But I've also got this second joystick and I think I got both of these from uh, Tony Clark up in Canada, who's a great guy. He sold me a bunch of stuff for Qbert and, and some other games. This is a very similar joystick, but these are not the same. So here is, here's the one that I was showing you. This is definitely an original Qbert joystick. And this is something else. So there's a couple different differences here. So right off the bat, you're gonna notice, I mean, there's some damage on this. Somebody kind of drilled out the mounting holes, whatever. Right off the bat, you notice uh, that the kind of dust washer area is a bit different. You know, uh, real original Qberts uh, very sort of iconically have this kind of like cone raised kind of uh, integrated uh, dust washer sort of thing right here. And this one doesn't, right? So that's the first sign that things are a little bit different. Looking underneath, it also has the uh, STC Rotterdam branding here. The number is the same. It is micro switches. It's got the same actuator. Uh, this stick, uh, the shaft itself is the same length, right? Uh, but you can see there's something else going on down here. So this sort of second layer here uh, is shorter on the original real Qbert and is longer on this side. The sort of bottom piece is about the same, but you can see these sort of uh, pillars right here. Uh, the light isn't really helping. The pillars on this right one are longer. So this is a bit weird. And at first I was thinking, maybe this is actually a Qbert Cubes joystick. So doing some research on Clav and elsewhere, the Clav forums. Um, the Qbert Cubes joystick was a little bit different. It didn't have the dome. It was more like this. It was still a Rotterdam, you know, four-way uh, joystick like this. But the problem is <laughs> the, uh, the Qbert Cubes uh, shaft was tapered, right? So this goes straight up and down. This goes straight up and down. A Qbert Cubes uh, joystick shaft sort of tapers and becomes more narrow towards the, the bottom or towards the base. And so this is not a Qbert Cubes joystick. Or is it? Because if I, if I was to remove the, uh, the shaft from this joystick entirely, and I just looked at sort of the, the base down here, this is absolutely our Qbert Cubes joystick. But this is a Qbert shaft, right? So I think what happened was somebody took a Qbert Cubes joystick and maybe the, the ball top got broken or something like that, and they replaced it with a shaft from a Qbert. So I think, my theory is, this is a Qbert Cubes joystick base with a Qbert shaft, okay? So they kind of Frankensteined it together. So I think ultimately what I'm gonna do is uh, I need two Qbert joysticks and I don't wanna use a Qbert Cubes. I want it to be as close to original as possible. So I'm going to kind of take the best parts I can out of both of these and create one really good original Qbert joystick. I mean, you can tell the, the ball top on this is almost melted. I don't know if somebody was holding a, 
a lighter to it or something, but it's all melted and, and messed up. Uh, but the actuator is not cracked. So uh, and we'll see what else is going on here. I mean, this has been drilled out. So I think what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll sort of cannibalize the best parts and put them together to make this original as good as possible. And for my second cabinet, I'll probably either uh, buy a reproduction joystick uh, from Arcade Shop, or uh, if somebody out there has a Qbert joystick for a good price, maybe if you want to trade, <laughs> I can do trade plus cash if you're looking for most of a Qbert Cubes uh, uh, joystick. Uh, we'll figure something out, so yeah. But yeah, I have decided to restore both of these cabinets as Qberts. I think what I'm gonna do is my buddy Mark, who you've heard me mention a bunch of times, he owns Back to the Media, uh, which is a used uh, music and game and uh, comic book store out in Winchester, Virginia, not too close, not too far away from me. Uh, he's working on opening up a arcade uh, in the back of his uh, store, and he really, really wants a Qbert. So I think we're gonna work something out. I'm gonna restore you know, both of these cabinets to Qberts. Uh, he's going to have a J-Rock. The one I keep for myself is going to have original hardware boards and everything. So that'll be awesome. Mark will get a, uh, an awesome Qbert. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically the plan. So what I need to do is uh, rebuild uh, this joystick. So there's a couple of videos out there that I've, I've uh, reviewed kind of in preparation for this because this joystick is a little bit different than most that you'll find. It's not built like a Wiko. It's not built like a Nintendo or anything like that. It's a little bit different, so I know uh, Jack Lick did a, a, a had a video where he rebuilt a uh, rebuilt a Cubert joystick as part of his Cubert restoration, and I think Galaxy Games 843 also did a video on this. So this will be my first time. We'll kind of do it together. So there, there's a couple different ways you can attack this, and uh, yeah, the the other sort of challenge here is I want to reuse these micro switches, um, but the original uh, harness has been removed. It's been clipped off, but it was originally soldered on. So. I think I want to be very, very delicate and remove this solder. It's very kind of almost dangerous to uh, solder and desolder micro switches because you can send heat down these uh, uh, leads or whatever you would call them, the legs, and melt stuff on the inside. So I've got to be very, very de uh, delicate. I'm not going to do that on camera right now. I'm just going to try to disassemble this. So I think I'll start by unscrewing and removing uh, all eight screws holding in these uh, four micro switches. So I'll just use my screwdriver and uh, <laughs> find a bit that small. So let me, let me go and remove these screws real quick, real quick and then I'll come back and show you how I'm doing. All right, so here's the last screw on the last micro switch and uh, there we go. Now that looks a little bit uh, weird and uh, I think what I can do now is uh, take this sort of top layer off. Uh, what I'm gonna do with that, there are these like um, uh, slotted flathead uh, screws at the top uh, and then there are uh, Keps nuts, um, 3 8 inch, inch Keps nuts, Keps nuts at the bottom. So I'm going to hold that in place with a wrench and kind of do this with one hand so you can see it on camera and uh, unscrew these bolts. So let me do this real quick too. You know, I actually misspoke there a second ago. These are not Keps nuts. So Keps nuts are the ones that have the integrated uh, star washers in them. And uh, these star washers are separate. So it's a, a nut and a bolt and a, a separate star washer, but it's actually missing on two of them. So I don't know if that was, you know, sloppy job at the factory or uh, if uh, somebody's been, uh, you know, inside this joystick before. But anyway, all four of those bolts are off and this should just come apart now. Uh, all right, there we go. So there's our sort of top plate, which is in decent shape, needs to be cleaned. And here is this part of the joystick assembly. And I think these two halves should just separate now too. And there we go. And hopefully we can get it past the cracked actuator. And there we go. And look at that rusty mess inside of there. So I've got some cleaning to do. Uh, this four-way actuator has been, or four-way restrictor has been rounded out a little bit. I mean, metal against plastic, what do you expect? But yeah, look at that STC Rotterdam, full of rust in there. Lots of rust going on in here. <laughs> Oh man, so there's a couple different things here. Uh, yeah, okay, so there is a grommet, which is a sort of interesting, unique uh, design. There is this weird kind of clip, uh, and then a, a washer and a rubber ring, and I think there's a, a, a C, an E-clip uh, somewhere. So let me grab my needle nose pliers and uh, see what I can do to kind of remove this stuff. Uh, I think the uh, the actuator should just come off, um, but it could be rusted in place. I don't know if there's a piece of metal on the inside. Um, let me try to remove it like this. Um, 
it should just pop off, but this one is kind of cracked and like if I try to put pressure on it, yeah, it's just kind of breaking. Um, let me see if I can force this thing off. Here, watch this. Yeah, there it goes. It's just kind of disintegrating here. So we'll just kind of break it off. Man, this is rusted bad. I hope I can salvage this joystick. Oh, these things are not cheap. I mean, Tony gave me a great price and uh, I don't think he had been inside of this uh, joystick, but man, what a mess. Okay, here we go. There are, I mean, I don't think anyone makes reproduction actuators, but I've seen people use other uh, solutions uh, for it. So, you know, all else fails. Um, <laughs> I can always get, I can always fashion something as a, an actuator, but this thing just does not want to come off. All right, I was finally able to rip it off uh, with some pliers. So I think that's how it's uh, supposed to be. And I think this is all plastic. Um, so this, this looks okay so far. Obviously we've destroyed that actuator, but uh, it kind of is what it is. Now again, I've got this sort of weird retaining clip. I've seen a couple different versions of this. Sometimes E-clips, sometimes these sort of, uh, I don't know if this is technically a C-clip or what. This is all rusted though. So hopefully, okay, it is not welded. It's not rust welded together. I am able to kind of get it to, to move a little bit. Let me see if I can remove it without um, breaking the whole thing. All right, so in the process of removing that C-clip, I broke it <laughs> and uh, it went flying and I can't find it, which is, which is fine. Uh, the, uh, the Arcade Shop Rebuild Kit does include an E-clip, which you can use instead, which is totally okay. And so this will just pull out now. There we go. We'll take a look at this in a second. We got a couple different pieces in here. Whoa, uh, did, I, did I find that C-clip? No, okay. So we've got a washer and this washer is all rusted. We'll have to replace that. Uh, we've got a rubber O-ring, which is totally covered in rust. And let me see, does it have any kind of springiness to it left? Uh, a little bit, but feels uh, kind of all, <laughs> no, uh, worn out. And uh, then we've got our old, <laughs> our old uh, grommet in here, which is kind of like a, a dense foam material. Let me see if I can kind of pry it out with uh, a screwdriver or, or something. There we go. Now it's starting to come. So we'll pull that out. Uh, and that's okay. That's not as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, so it's definitely got, it's covered in rust, but it's not as uh, chewed up or whatever as I thought. Uh, looking at the new one, the new one's got a much uh, smaller hole. So maybe that'll help uh, retain this thing. So right now at this point, let me do this. Let me um, clean this up uh, really, really well. I'm gonna dis, I'm gonna get all the rust out and whatever. I'm gonna throw out the broken uh, plastic pieces. Uh, here is the, the joystick uh, shaft real quick. It's got a, uh, a plastic washer and also a metal washer. This metal washer is all rusted to heck. The joystick shaft is also really, really rusty. So I'll get this in the, um, uh, the, uh, the power drill and I'll, I'll sand the rust off. Um, fortunately, you don't really see this part of the joystick. You only really see the, the plastic part. So this is only on the inside. So not too worried about the aesthetics of it. And the, the, the plastic part itself is a little bit worn, but really not too bad. So I think this will work. And uh, this um, uh, metal washer though is way too far rusty. So I'll find a replacement for this. I think these are exactly uh, the same Two of these are the same side, the one that goes on the inside, one that goes on the outside. So that's good. So I'll get all the plastic pieces washed and uh, then we'll be ready to put the new grommet in and kind of reassemble it. And I'll go ahead and, and disassemble uh, this other joystick kind of on my own, but it'll, it'll look pretty much the same on the inside. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, it's the next day. Everything is clean and dry and ready to be put back together. Uh, we had an awesome monthly members only live stream last night. It was a ton of fun. If you weren't a part of it, you missed out. And we even picked up a, another new channel member really during the live stream. Uh, if you know the Retrobotics channel on YouTube, uh, Liam and Sam, uh, I do the uh, Coin Jam podcast every month with Liam. Uh, they joined last night, which is awesome. So a ton of fun. We got a lot of awesome people uh, in the Discord and in those live streams. So Cool, so we're ready to put this uh, Qbert back together, this Qbert joystick back together uh, with the rebuild kit. So 
Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I got all the sort of big plastic parts over here, and I'm gonna kind of, like I said, pick and choose the best pieces and you know maybe Frankenstein together are a great one. So for the top plate here, uh, we don't really have a choice. We have to go with this one that has the shorter sort of pillars. Uh, the longer pillars are really for that, I believe it's a Kubert Cubes joystick. Um, so we'll put that off uh, to the side. For our next piece here, this is like the restrictor plate. And these two are identical, uh, if it'll show up on camera. They even have the same sort of part numbers in there. 22-0250-X, uh, and they're basically both in the same uh, condition. I think this one is a little less worn out, like the uh, the four-way restrictor in there is slightly less sort of rounded out than this one, so I'll put this one off to the side and we'll use this one as our piece. Uh, and then our next piece here is our, I don't know, the top hat piece. And again, these are uh, identical, right? The exact same shape, the exact same size, uh, they have the same part number. Let's see if I can find it again here. Uh, there we go. 22-0260. It's the same on both of them if the light will kind of catch that. So we've got two here, and I think this one is a little bit better. This looks like, you know, there was an original groove here, which is still intact on this one. This one looks like that groove has kind of been uh, worn out. And uh, this one looks just a little bit more beat up, so we'll put that one off to the side and have that as, as parts. And let's see, we've only got uh, one intact uh, actuator, so we will keep this one. And then we have uh, a plastic washer that sort of goes on the top. And uh, comparing the two, uh, I don't think I did a great job cleaning this one, so we will go with uh, this one here. Actually, the one that was dirtier was in slightly better shape, so I went ahead and kind of scrubbed this a little bit better, so this is the one that we are going to use. So that's all the plastic pieces. Uh, we've got a couple of, of washers here. One goes on top, one goes on bottom. Uh, the, <laughs> the ones from the, uh, the original Cubert uh, stick are just completely rusted and shot, so uh, that is not going to be uh, used. So I've got just the two washers here. Again, I believe this is from the Cubert cubes. I uh, got the little bit of tarnish uh, sanded off of here, and uh, I think they're they're not exactly the same. Uh, looking at the ones that are all rusted, one is much thinner than the other. These the thickness is about the same. Uh, this is probably like a zinc or steel uh, washer, whereas this one, oh, if it'll focus, actually looks like one side is anodized. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, these are the two washers that we're going to use. Um, Comparing the two, uh, the ball top uh, joystick shafts, uh, this is the uh, the one that's in better uh, condition, or at least the plastic ball top's in better condition. I put it in the, um, the power drill and used a little bit of 80 grit sandpaper and then 220 and sanded off, you know, basically all of the, the rust off of this. I guess the lighting is really weird with the, uh, the workshop light here. Um, and it's okay, there's a little bit of pitting, you know, it's not perfect, but I, I think it'll do. And it's too bad that this one, uh, the ball top is really just completely chewed up, melted. You can see how bad that is. Uh, Cause this, this shaft is in better uh, piece, or better, con better condition, but there's no way I can buff out the really deep uh, holes, like bubbly holes that have been burned into this thing. So this is the one uh, that we're going to use. And then I did polish uh, just a little bit the plastic with uh, some Novus 2 and then some Novus 1. Um, so that'll be good to go. Uh, I did mangle uh, the, uh, I didn't lose it, but I mangled uh, the C-clip holding the second joystick intact. Uh, but that's fine because we've got new E-clips uh, to use. The, uh, the rubber um, ring, I guess, uh, that got completely destroyed, you know, taking it off. But that's fine. We've got new ones. And again, we have our... our old uh, grommet and the rubber ring from the uh, first joystick. And this is the grommet from the second one. And there must have been some kind of debris or plastic in there that was just completely rubbed to pieces because this is just a mess. And there's all kinds of uh, <laughs> nonsense here that uh, I want to throw out. Just total, total carnage <laughs> inside that joystick. So let's get that cleared out of the way. So yeah, here's our Cubert joystick rebuild kit from Arcade Shop. And there's really only three parts in here that we need. There is our main grommet, this large brown 
like rubber washer, basically. That's our grommet, and there's our little manufacturing dimple on that. We have our rubber O-ring, I don't know, white <laughs> ring. This almost reminds me of like a uh, pinball rubber. And then we have a new uh, E-clip. Uh, and I'm assuming they include these because either they must rust a lot, uh, typically, or people destroy them as they uh, <laughs> take the uh, original ones uh, apart. So that's good. We've got our plastic uh, pieces right here. And uh, yeah, so the first thing we need to do is fit, and I've seen people struggle with this, we gotta fit the uh, uh, brown grommet uh, into the this piece, and it kind of goes in, but then there's like almost, I'll show you on the other one, there's like these little, um, they're not grooves, they kind of protrude a little bit, I guess designed to grab and hold on to the grommet, but it makes it sort of tricky to really get the thing all the way in there and seated, although, I guess I'm not having that much difficulty with it. And uh, I've seen people have to use like uh, a tool, like the end of a tool like this, the rubber end, or um, I've also seen people use like uh, the blunt end of a Sharpie marker uh, to force it in there. But I think this is nice and seated. Um, we just push down and make sure we are all the way in. And then when we put the joystick shaft in, it's gonna push against it and wanna push the thing out. So. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. One of the things I've seen people do, because like, you know, right here, it just, the uh, the hole is slightly, is like enough for the, the sort of lower piece um, of the joystick shaft to go in, but the upper piece just doesn't want to go. And I've seen, like Jack Lick used uh, a bit of um, uh, disc soap to kind of lubricate uh, the joystick shaft so it'll go through the grommet. What I'm going to do is something a little bit different. I'm going to use this stuff right here. So this is Shin Etsu silicone grease. Uh, this is what I use to uh, lubricate my Nintendo joysticks actually, because Nintendo joysticks, we haven't uh, uh, rebuilt one together. They're a little bit different. They're all metal on the inside. So you have metal on metal. Most joysticks have metal on plastic and you don't really need to lubricate that because metal on plastic doesn't sort of, you know, like it'll wear out, but it doesn't like um, need to be lubricated. Um, but metal on metal joysticks do need a little bit of lubrication. A little goes a long way. And I use this uh, Shinetsu silicone grease. I think this is also used in like Honda cars somewhere. Um, but uh, we'll use a tiny, tiny bit of this and I'll coat the, uh, the shaft uh, with it and that'll make it easier to insert the uh, joystick shaft into that grommet. I'm actually gonna grab uh, a glove just so to minimize the cleanup. Um, and I think also this, uh, uh, silicone grease will maybe help uh, prevent rust, maybe, uh, from coming back, right? I didn't want to paint this with like a, um, oh, that's the old one, or the bad one. I didn't want to paint this with like uh, a clear spray paint or anything to kind of coat it. Um, but you can see all the, all the sort of pitting uh, that's going on there. So, a little bit of this silicone grease. And like I said, a little goes a long way. So like that is probably well more than enough. Put the cap back on. And I'm gonna rub it in between my fingers and then just put a coating of that stuff. Probably got way too much already on this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it'll make it easier for us to get this into the grommet. I don't think the silicone will uh, you know, react with anything, so. so that's good. I'll take the glove off, throw that away, minimizing cleanup. And uh, yeah, let me try to <laughs> put this thing in without it, oh, there we go. Oh, and I forgot. <laughs> Before I can do that, I have to put uh, the washer on top here. So this goes like right there, and I think this silver one goes on top like that. So we'll sort of flip those on. Here we go. And uh, yeah, with that silicone grease, it went right in, no problem. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's nice and, nice and seated in there. So that was easier than I thought it would be. So next thing that goes on is our rubber O-ring. So we'll slip that on like that, no problem there. And then our, our metal washer. And I'm gonna put the anodized side down onto the, the rubber O-ring. Uh, I don't know if that's a 
mistake or what, but that's the way I'm going to do it. Because uh, I don't remember seeing an anodized uh, side when I opened everything up. And now we've got to get this uh, E-clip on. And maybe I can kind of start it. And it's such cramped quarters in there, uh, in here. <laughs> Uh, if you can see what I'm doing, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to try to get it started by hand. Just start to get it going. And uh, I can't even get it lined up. Okay, after much consternation and gnashing of teeth, uh, I've got the new E-clip uh, properly seated into the groove on the joystick shaft. Uh, at first it went flying and I had to dig it out from over here. And uh, yeah, just it really kind of gave me a, a bear of a time. I think probably because it's not exactly precisely the right size. You know, the original was this uh, C-clip that's kind of all mangled here. And I don't know if the joystick's worn down a little bit or, or what, but uh, it's in there, feels good. So I think that's good to go. Uh, then I take the restrictor plate uh, sort of piece and that slides on like that and just kind of clips into place uh, temporarily. You know, the, the, the bolt holes sort of, you know, line up and they got a little, I don't know, notch in there that holds it together. So that's good for this section. And then I can take the upper part and it kind of slides right over. I don't think it matters too much what the orientation is as long as the, uh, nope, <laughs> that's definitely wrong. Okay, this is what I get for looking at the camera instead of focusing on what I'm doing. Come on, there we go. Okay. Uh, it goes in like this, <laughs> all right, because this this is what mounts on the underside of the uh, the control panel, and obviously the, the joystick sticks out the top, so that'll slide in like this. We'll line up the screw holes, and uh, yeah, then all I need to do is, uh, oh, I need to put the actuator on. That just slides on to the end here, just a little bit of pressure like that. Okay, almost feels like it kind of locks into place. And uh, yeah, then I just need to throw uh, the bolts in, uh, secure those down, and then of course uh, re-add the, uh, the micro switches, but I still have to remove the old solder from them and they screw uh, onto these holes here that almost look like ventilation holes or drain holes. So uh, yeah, we'll do all that uh, off camera, but uh, that feels really good. It's nice, it's no longer sloppy. So we've got our freshly rebuilt original Hubert joystick uh, pretty much ready to go. So that wasn't that bad at all. All right, it's now Saturday, the morning after another successful live stream. Uh, last night we did episode 12 of the Coin Jam podcast, which went great. And it was super awesome to have Chance from the Canadian Arcade join us as a, a bit of a impromptu last minute guest addition uh, to the program, especially because uh, yesterday's episode was our first without Jeremiah from Coin Op Corner, who decided to uh, step away from the podcast to spend more time with things that are very important to him in life, uh, and we wish Jeremiah well. And Jeremiah jumped into the live chat, so he's, he's doing great. Uh, but anyway, it's Saturday, so I need to get this video done, especially for Overtime Arcade channel members, especially Jesse Durgan, who joined last night just before the podcast started as uh, our newest Overtime Arcade channel members. We've been getting a ton of new members lately, uh, which has been awesome. I must be doing something right. We have all these people wanting to support the channel. So anyway, uh, and the colors look a little bit weird. There we go. So there's two last things that I want to do in this episode before uh, I, I pack it up. Uh, and the first is to strip the CPOs off of these old control panels, right? So we've got this one here that was converted to ATAX and this one over here that I think is uh, Twin Cobra maybe with the, the two helicopters. Now, I already removed uh, all of the old joysticks and buttons. I did that on my own. And ATAX had a bit of uh, plexiglass uh, on top of the CPO, which is fine. I ripped that off too, because this is just like a big sticker uh, that one on. It's not really like a true original, um, you know, like high uh, uh, density or, or whatever CPO. And as you can see, if I go like this, <laughs> oh my goodness, the original uh, Qbert CPO is underneath here, so uh, why don't I come over and we can kind of do this uh, close up. Uh, this is kind of uh, thrilling and disappointing at the same time because this CPO will just peel right off because it's really more like a sticker than a CPO, this, this uh, ATAX conversion CPO. Look at that. 
And some of it, uh, some of it stuck on like this fluorescent red kind of pink stuff is over here. But here is our original Qbert control panel overlay. And it looks like, I mean, it would need to be cleaned up, but this thing is in awesome original condition. That sticker really kind of protected it. And this original CPO was durable enough that it really wasn't damaged by uh, the, the conversion uh, CPO sticker coming off. Um, but obviously I can't leave this, right? So we have the two buttons uh, over here, what are the, the one player and two player uh, start buttons. Those are original. This hole in the middle for the, uh, the Qbert joystick, that's original, the four way sort of diagonal. But then we have um, two large additional holes that were drilled for uh, you know, player one and player two joysticks for ATAX. And then we have three additional uh, action button holes that were added. They actually used uh, the player two start button uh, as an action button in the conversion game. But uh, yeah, we're gonna have to fill these two large holes and these three smaller buttonholes. And there's a bunch of additional like um, holes that were drilled to mount uh, the new joysticks. But man, what a disappointment. Uh, <laughs> it's too bad that they drilled anything at all. I mean, they had to do the conversion because this original CPO looks so good. Like, I don't know if I can get real close here and show you just how uh, brilliant those colors are and how crisp everything is. But yeah, we can't deal with <laughs> holes in it like that. So, um, you know, when I, I took the, uh, the joysticks and buttons off and all that sort of thing, I, uh, I measured uh, the holes. So if we flip over and look like this and uh, from the underside, um, you know, the holes that we're going to need to fill. A couple things going on here I want to point out. So uh, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this the same way that I repaired the Pango uh, metal control panel for my Sega Pango restoration. Uh, we're going to get some washers and some JB Weld. We're going to fill the holes and we're going to cover it up with Bondo after we've sort of structurally repaired the holes. Get everything nice and smooth before uh, we put the, uh, the new CPO on, which I haven't even ordered yet. I need to do that. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is um, the original Qbert joystick didn't use carriage bolts. It didn't use carriage bolts to mount it onto the control panel, which is kind of the more typical way of doing it. Like even the converted, the conversion uh, joysticks used, you know, they had to drill holes for the carriage bolts. The Cuber joystick used these studs. It used four studs uh, in each uh, corner. And again, the, the joystick on Cubert is rotated. So that's why it's sort of in a diamond instead of a square. But they drilled through the holes where, they drilled holes where uh, two of the studs uh, used to be. Now, I'm pretty sure that the joystick would be fine, especially in a home collection setting. This isn't gonna go on location. You know, to be mounted on just these two uh, points, it might have, you know, a little bit of wobble side to side, but for home use, it would be fine. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna be satisfied with that. I, got, I wanna replace it, I wanna repair it the right way. So I went and I bought a bunch of these, like, posts, these, uh, these studs that are meant to be welded like like with real uh, a real welding rig, um, but I'm going to try to do it with JB Weld. So, you know, I'm going to have a on each side where I need to add these studs. I'm going to I'm going to put a uh, a washer in with JB Weld, and then I'm going to try to position uh, these studs on either side in the right spot. I think I might use the base of the joystick uh, to sort of make sure it's in the right position. It doesn't need to be. You know, there's a little bit of of tolerance there for where it could be. It can't be off by a lot, but we'll try to get it in there. Maybe I'll even try to fit it in the middle uh, of a washer just to make it as structurally sound as possible if I can get that all lined up. I'm not gonna do that in this video though. I'm just sort of getting prepared to do that. So I'll do that on both sides. And you know, when I mount the joystick, I'll be careful not to over torque the bolt onto these new studs just because I don't want to tempt fate there. I'll make sure these two are nice and secure because these are original ones that are actually welded uh, onto the, uh, the metal control panel. But that should be good. That should be fine. Um, but, you know, we'll do that in the next episode, the actual repair uh, of the holes. So um, what I want to do is uh, strip off these, this old control panel overlay and also do it for this one over here, which has the twin Cobra. Uh, this is a little bit more of a traditional CPO that's been applied. It's got some texture kind of wraps around uh, and it didn't have a uh, plexi a layer on top of it to protect it. The other thing that's going on with this one, though, is... Well, first of all, um, like, look at this. This is just painted black, right, the underside. And this one almost looks bare or anodized or what. So I don't know if, again, Gottlieb maybe changed their manufacturing processes over time because uh, there's quite a bit of a gap in serial number between these two cabinets uh, or what. So a couple things to point out over here. Uh, this one has all four of those studs have been, like, angle grinded off, which is unfortunate. 
So again, I'm going to have to try to figure out a way to, um, you know, get those uh, studs <laughs> mounted back on, right? Part of me thinks maybe I just go to like a, uh, um, uh, get somebody to actually weld uh, some on. I, I don't know. Um, the other thing, but I'll, so I'll, I'll figure that out. The other thing is they used Bondo to uh, fill these holes here. Uh, and I don't know if I can get the, get it to zoom in or get the colors right here. We got a little bit of glare. Uh, they used Bondo to fill the original hole. So again, you know, sort of the, the control panel is flipped. These are the player one and player two start buttons. And this is the hole for the original joystick. And then they drilled new holes for uh, joysticks and for buttons. And they had little like mini start buttons uh, at the top here. So, uh, and then they had actually, um, they were using duct tape to sort of be the backer, which is not what I'm going to use. Uh, I use like big uh, fender washers as a backer, maybe sometimes a little bit of, of packing tape, but they just left, they put duct tape on as the backer uh, for the repair and left it on. So I peeled that off. You see the residue, but they just use Bondo to fill these holes. And let me show you why you don't want to just use Bondo to fill holes in control panels. That's why. <laughs> Because it can be pushed, if you know where to push, and like see this one is cracking, if you know where to push, you can just pop it right out. And that Bondo, just, you know, just Bondo in a hole is not structural enough uh, to withstand, you know, being beaten on, <laughs> on a control panel. So that's why we don't use Bondo. Uh, the JB Weld is much stronger, and the JB Weld also has a little bit of flex, right? It has some flex to it, so, you know, if it gets strained, it will bend a little bit before it fails. Versus Bondo, when Bondo's just a wafer of Bondo, like I can just like, uh, well, you know, snap it, right? It's not gonna bend, it's just gonna break. So that's why we don't use Bondo. Bondo's great at the end to kind of smooth everything out and kind of fill in the gaps and that sort of thing. Um, but that's a reason why we don't use Bondo to fill these holes. We use JB Weld and washers and that sort of thing. So let me drag these over to the workbench and we'll start stripping off the, uh, the control panel overlays uh, from both of these uh, control panels. Okay, first up, I've got the twin Cobra uh, control panel overlay to remove. I kind of got it started a little bit. And this is a more traditional type of um, uh, CPO material. You know, it's got some texture. Like I said, it's a little bit stiffer than the ATAX. It was really just a sticker, which is why it came sort of right off. Uh, the top part kind of wrapped around uh, this lip. The bottom part didn't quite reach, so they used a bit of um, duct tape to kind of hold it on. And I've got it sort of started on uh, both ends just so it'll be a little bit easier for me to get going here. And I'm just gonna try peeling this off because this feels like it's coming pretty well. Um, so maybe we can get away without using necessarily many uh, tools or chemicals to, to do this one at least. So this is coming, this is peeling off uh, pretty well. It's starting to tear maybe a little bit over here. Um, but I can probably save that. There we go. So, yeah, look at that. This is, uh, oh, tore a little bit over here too. But I should be able to just peel, peel this off. Well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, I think what it might be doing is sticking to, oh, that was just tape too. This is just black tape. That is interesting. Okay. So that black stuff was not part of the, the CPO. I guess I should have taken a closer look. Uh, now that I look at it here, that kind of uh, makes sense. Uh, and they've got some stickers that they've added um, to indicate what the buttons do. So the way, you know, and this is not an uncommon thing for uh, conversions. They give you a graphic uh, for the CPO. Um, but, you know, the manufacturers of the conversion kit don't really know exactly what you're going to be mounting it on, right? So they don't want to print, um, you know, text or whatever to indicate what the buttons are because they don't know where the buttons are going to be, right? So they give you a nice big CPO, you put it wherever you want to put it, and then they give you these stickers uh, to kind of indicate uh, what the buttons do, provide those labels, right? Um, sometimes they'll also be like a... Uh, instead of a sticker, it could be like a little plastic, sort of in the same shape, a little uh, thin plastic kind of collar that goes around the button. Uh, I've seen that. That was like on the uh, uh, the Caliber 50 for the um, uh, the Frogger had that. So it's starting to get to the point where I can't quite peel it, right? It's starting to, uh, starting to come apart. So what I'm going to do is put some gloves on 
And we're gonna take uh, another shot at using the technique that uh, Dell from Dell's Arcade recommends. And when I first tried this technique in a recent Frogger video, it turned out to be a little bit controversial. Uh, so basically Dell recommended uh, using a oscillating multi-tool and getting a scraper attachment and just scraping off uh, the old CPO. And uh, I had some trouble doing that because I've got a Dremel uh, Multimax. This I think is like 10 or 15 years old. And uh, I bought initially some cheap uh, scraper attachments from Harbor Freight. Turns out they were universal, compatible with everything except uh, Dremel. So uh, it wasn't kind of uh, attaching right and would just fall off. Uh, I now have a official Dremel brand uh, rigid scraper that is on nice and firm and won't come off. But that other one, I sliced my finger up, like through a glove. Um, but a lot of people were saying, why are you doing that? Why aren't you just using uh, heat, a heat gun or a chemical stripper or something like that? And it was because Dell told me, use the, the scraper attachment and it'll come off in 30 seconds like butter. Uh, that was not at my experience last time, but it was because I was using the wrong scraper attachment. So now I've got the right one on my Dremel and we're gonna give it a run here and see uh, we can get. So I've got you know different speeds I can try. I've got it set at pretty low setting right now, but we'll uh, turn it on and see what happens. <laughs> That's not bad. All right, that's actually uh, working pretty well. Uh, I can experiment with different speeds, but let me go and strip this all off. Uh, I am gonna have to come back with acetone, uh, I think, and get a lot of the, uh, the uh, adhesive residue off, but uh, I'd say this is working pretty good right now. Okay, I'd say Dell, uh, you were right, buddy. That was pretty easy. Um, the only couple things I didn't like were um, uh, working around the, the holes that were drilled. Uh, apparently the uh, operator drilled from underneath, so there are burrs on, around most of the holes. And so working with the scraper, like you can see here, it'll get hung up on those lips, those burrs from where they were drilled. Um, and that was really the, the main thing. And the other one is, um, uh, the scraper attachment wants to walk a little bit on the Dremel, like ends up sort of, uh, you saw me maybe once or twice, turn it off and kind of straighten out the attachment, but I don't know, that might be just a, a Dremel thing. So yeah, uh, I don't even see where the, uh, you know, the, the mounting points uh, would have been on the, the top where they were uh, 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 welded. So yeah, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time. Uh, maybe I can kind of scrape off as much of the uh, even dried residue as possible before I you know, sort of clean it up with the acetone. And I've got some work to do on the, uh, this sort of lip here, but I'd say this worked uh, pretty well. Um, so let me go and grab the other control panel and we'll do that one too. This one's gonna be a bit painful because it's this beautiful original. I mean, it's destroyed because of the, whole, the huge holes that were drilled, um, but this looks uh, so good. So hopefully this will be looking more like this uh, soon enough, but... Um, yeah, and this creates a huge mess, but at least it's a dry mess that's easy to clean up and not in a million pieces of melted plastic and full of chemicals and whatever. So I'm not so worried about cleaning this up, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, oh no. Let's scrape uh, Cuber and friends uh, off of this control panel. I kind of destroyed uh, Coily down here, which was kind of a bit messed up already but I think I might be able to save a little bit of Qbert, <laughs> at least to uh, keep as a memento.
All right, uh, I'd say that worked. This one, the uh, there's a lot more uh, adhesive residue from the original um, CPO than the, the uh, conversion. But um, yeah, I, I still need to do a bunch more detail work, right? I'll try to spend some time getting as much of the residue off uh, with the Dremel scraper as I can, but I'd say that's working pretty well. Uh, I do need to use the um, uh, acetone to remove uh, the rest of the adhesive. And again, it's interesting to me that this is painted black. You would think they would paint it white to make the uh, CPO colors uh, pop. But uh, yeah, huge mess. <laughs> but I think a success. Thank you, Del, for the tip. Uh, proving all the doubters wrong, that's a good way to, uh, to do this. So yeah, let me get set up for the last thing we're going to do in this episode, which is uh, do another test of the PCB and especially the soundboard with all the new stuff that I have, uh, the parts that I got from Dell. So let me go set up for that and we'll uh, keep your fingers crossed and hope that it works. Okay, here goes nothing. Everything is wired back up again, plugged back up again. You haven't seen these, uh, these boards since I think September is the last time I worked on these, but everything's plugged back up. The speaker, the boards, uh, the uh, soundboard here that we've never heard working. Uh, this is the biggest addition here. This is the utility board. It's got the, the sound or the volume pot, coin counter, et cetera. Uh, and I also have a knocker uh, over here that's wired in. Uh, and I have it sort of temporarily attached to the table with this uh, <laughs> vice grip. So I don't know if that coil works. I tested the fuse, it seems okay. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to fire in attract mode because attract mode is really all we're going to be able to stay in. Because uh, I've got everything wired up, everything plugged in except for three things. I don't have the coin door plugged in. I don't have the uh, control panel plugged in. And I don't have the marquee light plugged in, which is no big deal. Uh, I thought I maybe had a control panel harness, uh, but I don't. Uh, and I'm going to have to buy or, or rig something up to attach uh, the joystick and start buttons uh, once I get that done. But I think that'll be okay. Uh, and like I said, I do have the speaker wired up. And I've got a second microphone uh, right here <laughs> that might be picking me up in stereo, but I've got it pointed right at the speaker in case it's really quiet, like if there's an amp issue or something like that. But I think uh, we are ready to fire this bad boy up and see if we get any sound whatsoever. Uh, I know the board works, I know the game works, um, and what we're, what we're hoping for is some kind of sound. And usually there's sound with Cubert as soon as the game fires up. So keep your fingers crossed here. Uh, I've got the uh, the two interlock uh, switches are pulled, so I just have to hit the main switch here. I've got a bunch of grounds temporarily attached with uh, alligator uh, jumper wire. So here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. Three, two, one. Hello, I'm turned on. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> Do you hear those jumping sounds? So uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> it works! <laughs> it's alive! <laughs> so what that tells me is a couple of things. Uh, like you see on the screen here, it's showing the, um, you know, the instructions on how to play. And you see Cubert jumping around, uh, and we hear the sounds. Yeah, and that's even showing up on the levels on the, uh, the microphone receiver. So, uh, <laughs> and yeah, the, the uh, picture looks a little bit washed out, and it's got a bit of a wave. I need to recap it and everything, but it, it, it works. Um, it's a uh, vertical uh, 4900. Um, but we learned two things. We learned two things. One, not only is the soundboard working, and that's confirmed by the sound effects from Cubert jumping around, but when we heard that speech at the beginning where as soon as you power on the game, uh, Cubert says, hello, I'm turned on, uh, <laughs> basically announcing it has woken up to the world. Uh, that proves that the speech chip works too, that SC01, I think that's what it is, right? Uh, yeah, SC01-A is the one on this board, um, which is not a cheap, cheap, not a cheap chip to replace. I, I know people have been working on uh, reproductions of it, but uh, those chips alone are very expensive. I think people cannibalize them. Uh, let's see. So we heard the sound effect from uh, coily falling off, but not that uh, coil uh, firing. And again, I don't know if it's supposed to do that in uh, attract mode or only when the game is playing. So I'll have to do some research. If you know, let me know if, if uh, maybe that coil uh, possibly needs to be replaced. But I am thrilled right now. We have a working soundboard. And I guess what it was, was uh, we needed that um, utility panel with the correct uh, volume pot. So. 
That is awesome. You know what I'm going to do? Let me turn up the volume. Make sure I can do that. So, almost to max. Hopefully not too loud for you. And I'm going to power cycle the game. Because I want to hear Hubert's voice again. So that was great. I got that utility panel from, uh, from Dell, from Dell's Arcade. Also, no, I'm, I'm actually not wearing a hat right now. Oops. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I know that the... Uh, there's another amp on the board, or there's a there's an amp on the board. I haven't recapped the uh, the soundboard. Maybe I should probably uh, at some point. But the um, uh, there's a an amp on the Cubert soundboard that has uh, a heat sink on it, and that's kind of loose. It's not really soldered in place. Like I think it's okay, but that would be another thing that I was going to look at if it wasn't working. And I'm still going to resecure that. But uh, it is working. It's fully working. I mean, we haven't tested the controls, but wow, this is awesome. Okay, so I got the sound cranked up maybe to 90% of max. So let's hear that beautiful Cubert speech one more time. Three, two, one. Hello, I'm very bad. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, I'm so relieved. Now the sound effects are gonna be super loud. So let me turn that down a little bit. Oh my gosh. There we go. So anyway. <laughs> I think that'll do it for this episode. I am thrilled right now. So what did we do we, uh, in this episode? I mean, it feels like I didn't do much, but I think we accomplished quite a bit. We made a dent in this project. Uh, we made a decision on what we're going to do with the, uh, the sides of the cabinets. We are going to uh, use laminate, and I think I'm probably going to go with this um, uh, Pionite uh, Prism Yellow uh, and Satin. Maybe I can find a semi-gloss. Maybe they have different finishes. So that's what we're going to do for the sides of the cabinet. Uh, we rebuilt the joystick, so here is our freshly rebuilt original Cubert joystick, and I went ahead and uh, cleaned the solder off of the micro switches and mounted them back on the bottom of the cabinet. I was so worried uh, about what Ty was saying uh, about um, being very careful with solder on the micro switches because you can melt uh, the, the sort of you know, wiring inside or whatever. So I mechanically removed it. I cut off as much as possible with um, uh, side cutters, micro cutters. Uh, and then I kind of used a file to get it all off. Uh, and I haven't tested the joystick yet, but I, I connected each micro switch to, a, uh, to my multimeter and it seems to work good. So yeah, this feels nice. Uh, it's not too stiff. Uh, it doesn't, it only works in four directions, four way. So it doesn't trigger, you know, when you try to go on the diagonal. Um, so awesome, excited about that. Uh, what else did we do? We stripped the, uh, the old conversion CPOs off of both control panels. We've got a game plan for what we're going to do to repair that with JB Weld. And uh, yeah, we <laughs> got a successful test now of our sound PCB, including the speech chip. So I would say, unless we've got some issue with the controls, which we'll sort out later, we've got a fully working Cubert uh, board set here, which is phenomenal. So I'm on a bit of a, a high right now. I am thrilled about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So yeah, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thanks for watching. If this is your first time, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new episodes that I release every Sunday afternoon. Um, sometimes I'll throw in a short every now and then. I got a bunch of shorts ready to go that I need to uh, get out. Um, uh, if you like the video, hit that hit that like button. Uh, leave a comment. Share this video to other people that might like. You know, do you remember Cubert? Do you love you know? Cubert's an awesome game. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you really like the video, you know, think about buying some merch from the channel. I got a store, got lots of cool stuff. I got more stuff on the way coming later this year. Uh, and if you want to support the channel, click on that join button to learn more about what it means to become an Overtime Arcade channel member. You get to support the channel. You get some great perks in return. I want to thank all the new channel members. It's been phenomenal. This thing has really kind of taken off. Anyway, <laughs> as always, I'm Charlie. You've been watching Overtime Arcade, and I'll see you next time. Oh, 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 overtime! overtime.